and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, I've been thinking a lot about the Middle East these days, in part because being an American and following the, you know, the drama, the excitement, the the terror that is our new president, Mr. Donald Trump, and the changes that are going on diplomatically, uh, the focus of a lot of U.S. foreign policy is taking place in the Middle East. And it's interesting because at the same time, uh, China is also focusing a lot more attention in the Middle East. They've done this huge deal with the Saudi Arabians for up to $65 billion in oil. And for the focus of our conversation today, we're going to be focusing on, Ara- on, on the Arab street and Egypt in particular. And the engagement that's been happening over the past two or three years between China and Egypt uh, has been fascinating to watch, in part because they look at Egypt just the way that everybody should as the heart of the of the Arab world. The Arab street as we know it is defined in Cairo. And yet, although Egypt, you know, in many ways is the, as we talked about, the heart of the Arab world, it is also one of the most important African countries as well. So it sits in this very, very important geopolitical corner and touching all parts of the Gulf, the Middle East, and Africa. And that's also one of the reasons why the Chinese are so interested in Egypt is because of the One Belt, One Road or the Maritime Silk Road, and it passes through a very, very strategic part of Egypt. So on the one hand, it's very interesting to see what China would like to do in Egypt and how that might, you know, kind of affect the U.S. But on the other hand, it's also very interesting to see what Egypt is wants to get from China um, and how China is influencing Egypt's ideas of development. And it broadens the the scope and the concept of what we think about uh, the Chinese in Africa, because too often that discussion focuses on black sub-Saharan Africa. And I think in so many ways, we have to focus a lot more attention in what's happening in North Africa, particularly in Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, and of course in Egypt, because a lot of activity is going on there. And that's why we're so excited to have on the show today, Kyle Haddad Fonda, who wrote a very interesting piece for the World Politics Review, Egypt and Other Arab States Embrace a Chinese Model of Development. It came out uh, in the middle of March. You can find it on the World Politics website at World Politics Review. Uh, a very good morning to you, Kyle. Thank you for joining us from Seattle, Washington. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, listen, you talked about Egypt and you've done a lot. You've done your PhD on you know, Middle Eastern Chinese affairs. You've studied this for a long time. What is different today in the past, say, 12 to 24 months between North Africa, Egypt, the Middle East and China? Um, just in the in the past year, we've seen a lot more Chinese investment in the Middle East and Chinese engagement. And um, specifically with Egypt, one of the things we've seen just in the past two months is a huge number of Chinese tourists going to Egypt. It was now the um, the fourteenth most common destination for Chinese tourists going abroad over the Chinese New Year holiday. Why do you think that is? Um, there's been a lot of encouragement of people to go to Egypt. It's certainly something that Egypt needs uh, at a time when it's I mean, it's getting hardly any tourists from the United States and, and much many fewer from Russia since the plane crash in 2015. And it's, um, it's a place that has just come onto the Chinese radar screen in a big way recently. Um, one of the one of the big stories we've been following about China Egypt relations has been the 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 announcement that uh, Egypt is planning to build an entire new administrative city um, next to Cairo, um, with the the added announcement that Chinese companies are gonna are gonna be constructing that, and then recently the announcement that the Chinese companies have actually withdrawn from the deal. Like, what was happening there? Like, where is the where is this um, new city project standing at the moment? Uh, this is this is a complicated issue, and sometimes you have to read between the lines. It was March 2015 at a conference in Sharm el-Sheikh on the, the Red Sea coast of Egypt that Egypt's, we can still call him, new president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, announced that he wanted to build a new capital city. The idea was to take over some desert to the northeast of Cairo, where currently there's nothing, and to just build a city 
that can accommodate 5 million people with 40,000 hotel rooms with an airport that's bigger than Heathrow and a central monument that's taller than the Eiffel Tower. It's, it was really the kind of project where you can just imagine someone in the Egyptian government saying to the architects, hey, go nuts, whatever you want, put it in, we'll announce we're building it. And from the, from the day it was announced, it seemed like this was just way too ambitious to, to ever happen. But it was announced at a time when Sisi, the, the president, a military um, former member of the Egyptian military who overthrew a democratically elected leader, really needed to distract attention from some of the political conflicts in Egypt and to, to demonstrate that he was the kind of person who could transform an Egyptian economy that has a ton of problems. And the way that he chose to showcase his economic uh, program was to say, was to really just to go all in on a single building project. It was announced in March 2015 that the capital would be funded by an Emirati corporation, which pulled out almost a week later. And for about a year and a half, people didn't hear very much about the capital. And then in September 2016, there was the news that two state-affiliated Chinese companies were going to be involved in the construction. And the first phase was going to be built by the China State Construction Engineering Corporation. They actually secured a $3 billion bank loan in order to spend $3 billion building the first phase. But on February 7th, 2017, they pulled out of that deal. They were unable to come up with a final contract to build the first phase of the capital. There's another Chinese corporation which is still planning to build the second phase, but obviously they can only build the second phase if the first phase gets built. Now the Egyptian government says, that's okay, we'll build it ourselves with Egyptian contractors. They, the military claims to have started surveying the site, but it's, sort of, it's a project that's very much in limbo. It doesn't surprise me that it's in limbo in part because the numbers that were being thrown around for this were just absolutely huge. I mean, I think I saw something like 25 or up to $40 billion dollars and and that made me suspicious because that's not really the way the Chinese work in other parts of the world where they, you know, typically when they invest massive amounts of money in infrastructure development, there's often, you know, something on the other side, whether it's oil or natural resources or a big market in the case of Nigeria. Uh, there's something there. And Egypt, one of the the puzzling things about it for the Chinese is it doesn't really offer them uh, a lot of the usual trappings that they would be appealed to in, say, other parts of the world in South America or Africa. So I think it's going to be interesting, Kyle, and I'd like to get your take on this. Here's a quote that I'd like to, to – I want you to listen to from He Wenping. She is one of the leading Africa experts at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing, which is the kind of main – think tank on foreign policy and some domestic policy issues. But uh, we've had uh, Wen Ping on our show and she's very good at articulating some of the Chinese positions. And here she explains the two main reasons why President Xi Jinping and the Chinese foreign ministry are particularly interested in Egypt at this moment. China now has attached the greater and greater importance to Egypt. Uh, you see, Egypt is such a very important and influential country, uh, not only in the Africa and also in the Arab world. And also, after those years like uh, social and the political transition, now the country now is back on the track for the uh, political stability and also for the economic uh, recovery. So China would like to engage uh, closer with the country to uh, make joint effort to uh, develop their economy. And the second message, I think, is now China, we have the one belt one road initiative and Egypt also they have developed their own like Suez uh, canal there is a corridor economic uh, development belt so this uh, strategy Egyptian strategy and China's strategy now it's the time to bond together as well so those two messages I think is very important two messages there so one Egypt is a market of 90 million people uh, it's it's more stable today than it has been in the past few years. Whether or not it's more democratic or there's more civil rights and freedoms, that's a different story. And well, then the other one is One Belt One Road and and China's you know grand global trading strategy. What's your reaction in terms of uh, of what Wen Ping said? Well, first of all, it's it's not necessarily a different story. Um, I mean, CC's government has been 
incredibly restrictive on freedom of, of expression and it's been incredibly brutal toward its political opponents. So to say that Egypt is back on track for political stability, which was, which was what um, she said, is something which is a pretty bold statement in this context. And it really does demonstrate the extent to which the Chinese government is comfortable dealing with authoritarian regimes. Yeah, but that's not that's a cheap shot in part because the Americans supported Hosni Mubarak for, you know, oh, for decades. Of course. And the American I mean the, our current administration absolutely supports the CC government and and to some extent so did our form, the former administration. Absolutely that's true. So, you know, could so, so taking seeing it from the Egyptian side, um is do you feel that there's something in the Chinese model of development that particularly appeals to the, to the current Egyptian government? I mean, I think there's something in the idea of pointing to China and saying, look, here's a country which has accomplished the most dramatic economic and social transformation of, of, of all time. And, and, and simply saying, you know, we, we can do that too. Now, whether or not they actually can is a question that remains to be seen. But simply having the Chinese blessing for Egypt's own plans is huge. And, and I think that's something that's been the case in the Middle East for a long time, that you can point to the Chinese model, whatever it stands for at that time, and once upon a time it was a model of revolution. Now it's a model of economic development. Um, but you can point to it and say, well, if they did it, and they say we can do it, then maybe we can really do it. And and do you think they can? I mean, if if you look at you know if one looks at some some of the specific aspects of of the China the way that China developed this weird, the complicated mix between extremely strong private enterprise and yet also central planning with a lot of the enterprise running through state owned big state owned companies who also operate and compete with each other in international markets for example that kind of model is is do you think that Egypt has that kind of capability to to emulate it on that way or is it more a general idea of like oh strong government would equal uh, you know would equal some form of, of um, economic growth I mean, obviously, Egypt doesn't have some of the advantages that China had um, at the time that it began its current phase of development. But, um, you, you know, I think the um, I think the Egyptian government is um, at, well. Let's just say, I think, I think governments in the developing world have been told by, for a long time by the United States that there's a certain way that countries are supposed to develop. And the idea of saying, no, we can do it, we can do it like the Chinese have and not surrender any, any authoritarian uh, ideals for the government is a very attractive thing. I, I personally don't think that the capital project is likely to get off the ground in a big way. Uh, I think that Egypt's development will continue to lag very, very far behind China's. Um, but we'll see. You brought up earlier this question of uh, civil rights and political rights. And and I always find that very interesting. And, and I'm not suggesting that you are – that I, I'm not sure where you stand on this. But – Oh, I'm generally were, in favor of them. Okay, you're in favor of it. And, I, and I'm going to make an argument against it. And I just mm -hmm. for the devil's advocate here, that when we look at the fastest growing economies of the 20th century, Korea, Singapore, China, uh, even Hong Kong to many extents, none of them came up in a, in a, in a de democratic context. Taiwan as well was under martial law for most of its, its time in the 20th century. Um, you know, then we look at the United States and how we developed we didn't have full democracy for for much of the early part of our development. We had, you know, a third of our population was enslaved. Women didn't have the right to vote. It was a classist society. And yet now in this in this stage of history, we kind of go around the world and say, well, everybody should be like us in our most advanced stage of development. So you should have full civil civil rights, religious rights, association rights and all those things. And yet the evidence seems to point that those societies that are less democratic 
oftentimes develop faster economically and socially. And what now in Africa, let's take a look at some of the strongest economies. Ethiopia, certainly not a, dem a democracy. R Rwanda, Paul Kagame has limited civil and political rights. And, and this is where we get into this tension between people who live in lesser developed countries and the West. And more often than not, what I hear, and this is just my anecdotal evidence, is people would rather have strong social and economic rights at the expense of civil and political rights. And we in the West, with our bellies full for the most part, will say that civil and political rights always are paramount to everything or are at least equal to social and economic rights. So talk to me a little bit about when you, you said Egypt and other Arab states embrace a Chinese model of development. To me, there's a very, very good case for the way that the Chinese have developed in part because they have lifted more people out of poverty in a shorter period of time than any other country in human history. And if I am al-Sisi sitting in Cairo, I'll think that's what I want to do rather than give up uh, more civil and political rights. Well, there's certainly a, a bargain that states can make with their citizens. We'll provide you with certain advantages and in exchange, you know, there are, there are things you can't do. And in, in China, certainly a lot of people have been willing to make that bargain. And in, in Egypt, perhaps they would as well. But Egypt is a much more divided society than, than China, I think, because the battle lines are so clearly drawn between the supporters of the Islamist government of Mohammed Morsi, which was overthrown, and the supporters of the military government, which has replaced them. And Egypt has become um, restrictive of freedom of expression in a way that it never was under, or, or in a way that far exceeds what it was under the, the case of previous military rulers. And, and so I, I think that in the Middle East right now, you have some divisions of, of, of whatever kind in, in different Middle Eastern countries which are really challenging to overcome. I mean, you have open warfare in certain parts of the Middle East, and that's going to be a different environment from making some of these bets about development than what you get in other places that are maybe a little bit more stable. To take it to a, a slightly wider canvas, um, you know, one of the reasons that China is so focused on on Egypt and um, is, uh, you know, because it's, it slots in so well with its plans for the One Belt One Road expansion. Um, you know, kind of both the both the, the Belt and the Road, the the, the overland and the overseas um, parts of of that expansion run through parts of, of the Middle East and, you know, and obviously, you know, the shipping lanes run through the Suez Canal. Um, how is that expansion seen from the kind of North African and Arab side? Um, is there a, a, like, big enthusiasm for that, um, for that in Egypt? And is it getting a lot of attention? I mean, you certainly read news articles where people talk about the idea of One Belt, One Road. It's not necessarily the Chinese phrase that's been coined recently that I've been seeing the most. Xi Jinping went to Davos in January and talked about the idea of there being a Chinese voice. And I've started to see that um, pop up. And, you know, so there, I think there's a lot of ideas that have gained currency in Chinese international discourse, and they all kind of exist side by side. Um, and there, there's still sort of a lot of slogans that get thrown out, and One Belt, One Road is one of them. But I don't know that it's necessarily quite so preeminent right now. The article is Egypt and Other Arab States Embrace a Chinese Model of Development. Kyle Haddad Fonda is the author. Kyle, thank you so much for joining us on the show. We really appreciate it. Uh, by the way, everybody, if you want to download that article, you're going to have to go to World Politics Review. It's behind a firewall, but apparently if you have somebody send you a link and there's, it's a leaky firewall, so you can get it if you're really determined. Once again, Egypt and other Arab states embrace a Chinese model of development. Kobus, let me ask you your final thoughts on this. You know, I'm, I have mixed feelings about what I see in Egypt, in part because, again, something doesn't add up to me in terms of how Egypt doesn't fit the profile of other major sources of investment for the Chinese in Africa. But on the other hand, I do recognize the strategic value of Egypt and the importance of the Arab street. So in one sense, I can see it. But in another sense, I still struggle to get my head around it. In the sense that Egypt doesn't have natural resources. Correct. 
Well, I guess the Egypt's natural resource is its location. You know, kind of its its position. Um, you know, next to the Suez Canal, and it's this kind of gateway to the Mediterranean role that it's always played. So in that sense, I suppose it. You know, like China has to be there. There's, you know, if if they want if they want access to that to that route, then that Egypt is a natural place to invest in. And of course, the Arab Street is Cairo, and China is trying to make a play now for a much larger role in the Middle East and in the Persian Gulf. So I would expect that uh, you know, kind of trying to influence Ara- Arabic hearts and minds through an engagement in Egypt is also very important. So this is an issue that we will continue to keep our eyes on. For Kobitz van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. We'll be back again very soon with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at Eolander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa.